All right, let's open our Bibles up. <clears throat> We're going to take a little bit of time, and for the next three weeks, I want to talk to you about reconciling people to God, okay? It's real important. I believe it's the heart of our Father. So I want to take a little bit of time and focus on three ideas when it comes to reconciling people with God today. I want to talk about reconciling people. I want to talk about releasing words. I believe Tina came up and prophesied today about releasing words. I thought, well, gee, she must have been listening to my meditations. And I want to talk to you about resisting darkness. It's all going to revolve around the idea of reconciling others to God. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 18, I want to read to you a few verses on reconciling people to God. In the King James Version, it says, And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. I want you to notice that God wanted to get into the earth. And the way God got into the earth was he got in, in Christ. When Jesus came, God was in Christ and he had a goal. Well, he was working together and Jesus was working together with his father. He had a goal to reconcile the people to him. And he had a goal not to not to impute their trespasses against them. That means he came to help people. He came to fix people. He came to assist people. And he did not impute their trespasses against them. And he did not point his finger at them in scorn and say, what's wrong with your life? Look at you. Why are you acting that way? If you really loved me, you would have quit that a long time ago. He didn't point his finger in scorn. He didn't condemn. He did not judge the world. But he came to love them, to reconcile them, and to help them. And reconciliation doesn't just mean to be born again. If there was sickness, he came to reconcile that problem of sickness in their body. He reconciled it with himself, which was healing, and he got rid of the sickness. If there was fear that ministered to a person, his goal was to reconcile that person to God and deal with the fear. If there was discouragement or depression that seemed to minister to somebody, the same thing. His goal was to reconcile that person and to reconcile that problem so it wouldn't, it wouldn't exist in their life anymore. Well, we go on and we find out that not only was God in Christ, but now he says he's given to you and he's given to me a ministry of reconciliation. A lot of people will say, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know why I'm called. What, what is my gift? What is my purpose? Your purpose is to reconcile people to God. That's why you're here. You're not merely human. You're not here just to grow up and get a job. You're not here just to buy your home and to get your car. And to have children and, and then to take them to school and then to pick them up and to get groceries. You're not here to just live a natural life. You're here to reconcile people to God. Each and every one of us, I kind of look, look at life and creation and the world. I look at it like there was this amazing creation by God. But right in the middle of the creation was this big black box. Big dark box. 
And unfortunately, someone opened that box up, and when it did, there was an explosion, an explosion of like paint, dark black paint, an explosion, and all these spots landed on the human race. Landed upon the human race, and so they're all spotted. You and I are spotted. But you know, God gave you a gift to remove a spot off of me. And all the people around you that are spotted, which are all of us, he gave us a gift. You're carrying gifts and abilities to remove spots. You don't have to be amazing. You don't have to be this fantastic person. You just have to realize you've been given a ministry of removing spots. And all around you, there are people with spots, and they're just looking for someone to come up to them and to take the gift they have and the kindness that they have in their heart and the joy that God's put in their heart and the anointing that God's put in their heart and to take that and just wipe that spot off of them and send them on down the road. The biggest thing that wipes the spots off are just loving people. But you've been given a ministry of reconciliation. I don't know about you, but I've been around a little while. And I've noticed that most people struggle. And I noticed that most people struggle today with stuff they struggled with a year ago or five years ago. Or 10 years ago. And I think all of us have people in our families and people in our life and people we work with that, that, that they, they hate some of the things that they do, but they keep repeating things that blow their own heart up and blown their own life up and things that hurt them and things that hold them and they hate doing it and they feel condemned and they're embarrassed and they're shamed and they don't know how to get out, but they keep going back to the same thing. Am I the only one who's noticed that? Some of those people are as me and you. And you know that God wants to reconcile people to himself. But he said, you're here today instead of Christ, in Christ's stead. You're here today instead of Christ. In other words, God was saying, I have a lot of confidence in you because I've put the giftings in you. I've made you. I put the ability in you. And I feel real confident that you're going to be able to help remove some of those dark spots on people. You're here now instead of Christ. I know that we're not separated from him. I know that we're equal with him. I know that we're one with him. But I don't know for sure if each of us have really walked our days out with a mindset that we're here instead of him, that we actually are him operating in the earth because he's in us. And we're here instead of him. And God has confidence that you and I can actually achieve his dreams and his desires, and that we can actually wipe those dark spots off of people. I believe that's the mentality that God wants us to approach the world in, is to realize we're here to reconcile people. When you look at people on the job now, you're not going to be frustrated, and you're not going to get angry with them and be disgusted with them and and want to rebuke them for their sin and their wrongdoing, but rather you can see there's a spot and maybe, 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 maybe you're the one there not to be irritated but to wipe the spot off. Maybe not to point your finger at them in scorn and maybe not to judge them but to reconcile them to God and to get that spot off. Let's talk about releasing words. I want to look at James chapter six, chapter 5, verse 16. Very simple idea. I think this is a wonderful, wonderful text. It says, you're to confess your faults one to another. Now, my experience, people have a lot of faults. Now, are we really confessing these faults one to another? Do we have confidence Are we creating a culture where people feel safe 
telling you something about their life. Well, then you need to create that culture. Because when you are vulnerable and you allow yourself to be open like Pastor Mary, then people will begin to be vulnerable and open themselves up to you. If you're closed, they're closed. If you're closed, they're going to be closed to you. Okay? Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Amplified says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its workings. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now, I want to read out of 1 Kings 17 and 1, one verse, in Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. I wanted you to notice that we're talking about a man by the name of Elijah. And the Bible says this man had like passions and feelings just like you do and just like me. And Elijah lived in a day when he was looking at God and he stood before God. And as he stood before God, he was seeing his, his fellow brothers and his fellow sisters and he was troubled. He was troubled because he recognized that there were spots on his fellow brothers. And there were spots on his fellow brothers and sisters. And even spots on his own life, but he had it on the inside of him to reconcile these people to God. He wanted to reconcile these people to God, so he challenged the prophets of Baal. And they offered a sacrifice up on Mount Carmel. And Elijah obviously won the sacrifices, and then he stood before Ahab. And he said to Ahab, Ahab, he said, at my word, at the command of my voice, it will not rain again until until I command it to rain again. And so for the, year, for, the, for the space of three years and six months, it did not rain. At the command of Elijah's voice, and then at the end of that three years and six months, Elijah prayed, and the rains came. The reason I wanted to read that is because, you, you see, Elijah was looking at his culture he was looking at the people that were his brothers and sisters. He was looking at the culture around him, and he saw a lot of spots, and it really bothered him. And he wanted to somehow figure out a way to deal with these spots, okay? And what we see here is a man exercising his God-given authority and his God-given dominion against the elements of the earth. Kind of like when Jesus spoke to the storm and said to the storm, be still. And the storm stopped instantly. Well, Elijah commanded that there would be no rain. And for the space of three years and six months, there was no rain, the Bible says, at the command of his voice. And then again, at the end of that three years and six months, he prayed and it rained again. But James picks up and capitalizes on what Elijah did and ties it into working with people. And he's trying to say, guys, that you and I have influence over people. Just like Elijah had influence over the elements. And at the command of his voice, there would be no rain for three years and six months James is trying to say to you and trying to say to me that he had influence over the elements, but I'm not really talking about the elements right here, James says. I'm talking about people. People are going to come to you. People are going to be brought into your life that have spots. 
And I want you to understand that God has given you, he's given you authority. He's given you dominion. Behold, I give unto you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy that nothing shall by any means harm you. And remember, you're in a culture, in a world surrounded by people that have spots. And as your eyes open up to the spots, God wants you, just like Elijah, to begin to use your authority. He wants you to begin to release words over people. He wants you to begin to release the word of God over people. He wants you to realize that you actually have dominion on the earth. And when you release words over people, God can come behind those words to bring them to pass. Do you remember... The story in Matthew chapter 8 about the centurion, he came up to Jesus, said, Jesus, my servant, my servant is grievously sick. Can you help me? And Jesus said, you bet I can. I'll come to your place right now. He didn't give him an interview to find out if he was sinless. He didn't give him any questionnaire to make sure that he was not uh, messing up or to make sure that he was doing everything perfectly. He just said, you bet I'll come to your house. And a centurion stopped him and said, whoa, wait a minute. That's not necessary. He said, I'm a man under authority. I mean, I'm a colonel and there's a general above me. I'm under authority. He said, I'm under authority and I tell a man to go and do this and the man goes and I tell another man to come to me and do this and he comes. He said, all you have to do is speak the word. Release words. Release words. That's all you have to do. And Jesus was stunned and he marveled and said, I've never seen such great faith in all of Israel. Because what the centurion was saying was he was saying, listen, Jesus, I've been, I've been following kind of in the back of the pack. But I've been paying attention and I've noticed something. When you release words... Something changes in another realm. It's as if you have dominion and authority and you say to this thing go and it goes. And you say to another thing come and it comes. Something is changing in another realm and it's just like this hierarchy in our army that, that, that you're under authority. You're getting orders from a whole nother realm in place other than yourself and when you release words it's affecting things in this realm But the obvious changes are taking place in the natural realm. And he said, I just want you to release words and I know my servant will be okay. Very simple, very powerful concept and idea. You know why Jesus on the cross? Right before he died, do you know what he said? He said, forgive them. For they know not what they've done. You know why? He released the word forgiveness into the earth. And to this day, the power of that word is still freeing the hearts of men. Your authority, your effectiveness to remove spots, your ability to help others... Your ability to influence others, your own children, the greatest power you have is the releasing of words. I remember when God came to me just some ways back and he said to me, I want you to help your friend. I said, okay, I can help him. And I thought, well, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do to help my friend? He said, now your friend Your friend is struggling. I said, that's the truth. 
And, and, and not only is my friend struggling, but my friend has been struggling for a long time. And my friend keeps repeating the same thing over and over and over and over again. And, and then my friend always calls me, but he always calls me after he repeats the problem and is dealing with all the condemnation and the shame. And I help him. And I don't beat him up because he did it again, but I just love him. And I get him over the hump, and we get reconciled to God, and we begin the process again. But he said, Scott, he said, I want to teach you how to help your friend get free. I said, okay, I can do that. And he said, I've given you authority. I've given you dominion. He said, it's very easy for humans to forget there's another dimension in another realm that they get locked into the natural realm and they only want to do things intellectually. And they only want to have a conversation with the person to tell them what's wrong, how to do it right, what to do. And he says, Scott, people are in bondage. People are being held by principalities and powers. People are being controlled by the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. He said, you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. He said, this, this spiritual entity visits your friend. It influences his feelings, his thoughts, and gives him impressions that he thinks are his. And he said, here's what I want you to do. He said, and he told me what to, what to speak to. A specific spirit, he said, I want you every day to bind that thing. He said, you have dominion. What you bind on earth will be bound in the spiritual realm. And so each day I would wake up, and sometimes I would wake up in the middle of the night, sometimes throughout the day, five, six, ten times a day, three times a day, 15 times a day, day after day, week after week, month after month, I, I, I would think of this person and I would say, I bind you, you filthy devil. I bind you right now, the name of Jesus. I'm not trying to bind you. I'm not hoping to bind you. I'm not wishing to bind you. I said, you're bound in the name of Jesus Christ, and you will not minister to my friend. You will not give him impressions. You will not minister to his feelings, and you will not minister to his thoughts. You understand you have dominion, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. You're going to use your authority just like Elijah used his authority against the elements, but you're going to use them in reference to helping your fellow man that has some spots. Now, remember, his spot's no different than your spots. We think some spots are uglier than other spots, but they're all the same spots. There's not red ones, white ones, yellow ones, green ones, and blue ones. And yellow's only a semi-bad spot, and white ones are, are just a barely bad spot. They're all dark, ugly spots because they're all dark and ugly, and they're all the same ugly. That'll help you not judge somebody when you find out they did something that you think is worse than what you did, but you don't ever see the ripple effect of what you did. You just think you did this little thing, but you don't know it blew up 500 other people. You're welcome. <clears throat> it's easy to be a tough guy, isn't it? I like to be a tough guy. Sometimes I try to put my foot down. I could put my foot down on my wife, and I say, honey, I'm putting my foot down, and she smashes my toes. I said, what are you doing? I mean, I'm, I'm supposed to be in charge here, you know. But I'm not in charge. We're a team. We work together. You know what? She's got giftings I don't have. I got giftings she don't have. We're one flesh. I need her part. She needs my part. We work together as a team. <clears throat> Some guys, they say to me, bless God, I'm in charge in this home. I said, I'm happy you're in charge, brother. How's that working out for you? <laughs> I'm not in charge in my home. That might bother you, but I'm not in charge in my home. God's in charge in my home. And there's a lot of times God talks through my wife, and God says stuff to my wife, and I said, that was a Holy Ghost. I've been needing to hear that. I don't always tell her when it's God. <laughs> I 
That's still a little weak, Gary, you know. <laughs> and so about 30 days into praying for my friend and exercising my authority that was given to me by God, I began to see changes. And I thought, wow. I said, these are like obvious black and white changes. So I continued on, and, and I had the thought. I said to God, God, I said, sometimes I get a little confused because I don't know if I'm supposed to just bind this devil one time and at that moment believe it's forever bound, or am I supposed to bind it three times or ten times or five times, or what, what, what is the rule here? How, how do I do this? And, and I felt like God said to me, Scott, your friend is in bondage. As that thing visits him, he's going to yield to it unless he gets assistance. And so, as it comes up in your heart, I want you to take dominion over it and tell it it will not do this. And so, so that's what I did. That's what I did. And, and two months went by and three months went by. And I tell you, it is so stunning to me. And I, 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 haven't, even told, I haven't even told the person. I haven't even told the person. They don't even know. Like, I don't go and say, hey, I did all this for you. <laughs> I, just, I just, today, I, I stand amazed because I'm watching a person that's free today. I'm watching them have been totally delivered. I'm watching them think totally differently. I'm watching them act totally differently. I'm watching them talk totally differently. I'm watching their heart and how it's open totally differently. I'm watching everything 100% different. And I'm telling you that you have dominion. But we've been blinded. We've been blinded by the God of this world to be bound only to the natural. But I'm telling you, there's another realm. There's a whole nother realm. And it's critical that we begin to release words. I wouldn't just bind darkness. I would release words like, Father, I just want to thank you. I release, I release over my friend right now that what is blessed cannot be cursed. I release the blessing upon my friend. I release the anointing upon my friend. I release goodness upon my friend and I, and I just release that goodness to minister to his mind, to minister to his thoughts, to minister to his heart and I would use my dominion to release words. Now the reason you know this works is because you've released words a lot over people like you're stupid. <laughs> you're an idiot. And we release negative words and we release negative things that I'm telling you that death and life are in the power of what you release from your mouth. You're here instead of Christ. If Christ was here, he wouldn't release ugly over somebody that was messing up. He would release good over someone that was messing up. He would release anointing. He would release the glory. He would release the blessing. He would release the word of God. But we release the natural and then we want to talk to five other people about it. So you better beware of speaking wrong things. You with me? So let's talk about resisting darkness. We got a couple minutes left. We're going to read out of Exodus 17. I have so many, so many powerful testimonies about releasing words, prophesying words, releasing the anointing. I have so many amazing testimonies. I'm wanting to sidetrack and give them. They're, they're so, so good. And I have a lot of them mainly because I've been, I've been communicating with my boy. We talk every single day, sometimes two or three times a day. And in the last couple months, he said, Dad, we're going to practice releasing words. I'm thinking, he's getting me excited, you know. 
And I said to him, I said, son, I said, you know, when you were a little boy, you don't remember. Uh, I said, when you were a little boy, I said, I, I said, you don't remember kneeling down in front of Don Gossett and he put his hands on you. And I believe he released an anointing inside of you. And I said, it's been so amazing in the last couple months. I've watched a dozen things. He said, Dad, this is what we're going to release today. And, and we would release these words. And I think he would say to me, he said, on this specific date, by this date, this is what I'm releasing is going to take place. And it happens on the exact day. And I'm like, dude, I said, it's freaking me out. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, it's getting me fired up and making me say, you know, I'm going to start releasing the right words. There's power in words. Good ones and bad ones. He said to me right at the beginning of May, he said, Dad, April. He said, Dad, no, beginning of May. Oh, it's a, beginning of April. Oh, I keep thinking it's May. Jeez, I got a whole nother month left. <laughs> Time's going slow for me, folks. And um, he said that beginning of April, he said, Dad, by the 24th of April, I'm believing God in his job. He, he, he said, I want to have $2 million of gross sales under contract by the 24th. I said, I can believe that. I said, let's release our faith. Let's believe God. And you know, on the, uh, on the 20th, he was at about 800000 But on the 24th, he put enough under contract to exceed $2 million to the day. Now, to me, it's not about the contracts. It's about what you believe. It's calling things that be not as though they were. It's realizing more than anything that you are not a mere human, but you are a spiritual being here instead of Christ. And the words that you release are equal to words as if he would release them. But the power behind your words, because you're a spiritual being that was given dominion in the garden, you retain the dominion of power when words are released good and bad. So why not start releasing the right things? We, we're adults. We think, well, I don't need that. I don't know if God really wants me to have that. My boy, he just thinks God's good and every good thing God wants a blessing with. And he believes he's good and he just wants to go be a blessing. That's the way it ought to be. Our ceiling should be their floor. So in Exodus 17, verse 5, the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel. And thy rod, wherewith thou shalt smoke the river, take in thy hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and the people shall drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Meribah, because the chiding of the children of Israel, the complaining of the children of Israel, because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then, you can underline that, came Amalek and fought with Israel, and Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men. I like how God said, choose us. You're not in this alone, Moses. I'm in it with you. Choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. And Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, one on one side and one on the other, and the 
the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomforted or beat up Amalek and the people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for memorial in a book. Rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out of the, rem out of the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. You see, what took place was Israel had come out of Egypt, and Israel was about to move into the promised land. They were on their way there, but there was no water. And so God caused a rock, a rock to begin to provide water, and Jewish historians say the rock provided so much water that it literally created streams and rivers and ponds. But it said that as this water began to flow out of the rock, immediately the enemy showed up and said, no, no, we're taking it. We're taking the rock. You're not getting into the land. You're not getting anything. And I know for you and I today that we're not fighting over a piece of dirt and we're not trying to get natural water, but I know that out of your belly flows rivers of living water. But I want you to know that the devil, just like Emelech, He's not rolling over. He's not going to just lay down. I'm not talking about living life. I'm talking about forging into the masses of people and removing the spots. I'm talking about moving into a promised land that's been given and provided for the people of God because they're peculiar people, because they're born of God. Because they're the light of the world. Because the anointing of God rests upon them in God's good. Amalek stands up and says, no. No, you're not doing what you want to do. And no, you're not going to serve God. And no, you're not going to give what you want to give. And no, you're not going to minister healing. And no, you're not going to see your family restored. And no, you're not. And he'll push up against you. And he'll push up against those rivers of living water. He'll disqualify you until you are happy being a natural man. And you accept whatever it is. But we're going to have to begin to realize that we're going to have to resist darkness. You don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You don't wrestle, uh, you wrestle against principalities and powers. Don't you think that that friend of yours that's been it repeating the same problem again and again and again and again, he's not just a stubborn fool. He's bound by a devil. It shows up in front of you as a stubborn attitude. But we say you're stubborn and we give up on them. Because we say it's their choice, they're stubborn. They're just going to have to go through whatever they got to go through because they just refuse to submit. Maybe they're bound. Would you say that to a person bound by some kind of sickness or disease? But we say it to people when it comes to their soul, to their attitudes, to their stubbornness. We won't look at a sick man and say, let them go through whatever they got to go through. Ah, oh, that sickness is their own stubborn fault. We don't believe that. We believe there's an assault against them, something that's attacked them. We don't believe sickness is from God. We believe that Jesus went about doing good and healing all that was oppressed of the devil because we believe he, sickness is oppression, directly influenced and put upon a person from the devil. But yet when there's some stubbornness, we want to point at them and say, it's your fault. But maybe the problem isn't the stubbornness. Maybe the problem isn't the lack of manifestation. Maybe the problems that we got our eyes on the people instead of the spots. Maybe the problem is we're not exercising our authority enough. I've been practicing. I've been watching it work person after person. I know you're wishing I'd do it for you. Let 
Well, one person did lift their hands. The rest of them grabbed their horn. They tried to go up, and they put it down. <laughs> I'm just telling you, church, it's the spiritual world you're living in. God, help us and open our eyes up. If it were just me and my wife and our three, wouldn't be so difficult, I guess. But when you want to move out into the masses, you're going to deal with things. You're going to come up against stuff that intellectually you can't deal with and conversationally you can't deal with. And here is an amazing person that's been born of God or an amazing person that God's trying to win over. And the only thing holding him back is an unseen force. And we struggle because we're like, well, I really don't know. What do I say? How do I say it? Do I do it one time, two times, three times, four times? How do I do it? We, we're, we're almost illiterate in the realm of the Spirit. And how do you become illiterate? How do you become literate? Well, one, you come and you learn. Two, you get discipled and you learn. But third, the way you really learn is do it. You do it, and, and you do it until you figure it out. You do it until you begin to see a victory. Then you, got, you learned some things on that victory. Now you do, you do it again, and you fine-tune it. Even a baby falls 10 times or 20 times or 50 times before it begins to walk. Why does a Christian think it's abnormal to fall and to mess up and to make mistakes and to not see a victory and to lose a battle? It isn't on God's end that we lose. It's on our end because we're learning. We don't understand everything. We don't have the full picture. You see through a light in a glass dimly. You don't see perfectly. You're never going to see perfectly, but we ought to be gaining more light as each day goes by and each week goes by, and we ought to be gaining a little bit more victory and a little bit more confidence and a little bit more dominion, and we ought to not be afraid to stand up to things that we used to cower down to, and impressions of these things would defeat us. And so my encouragement to you is forge forward, church. I mean, you're going to have to move into territories that you don't really know for sure. If you're doing it right, call somebody up. Say, this is what I'm doing. What do you think? Call me up. Call Mary up. I'll give you Joan's phone number. No problem. You can call Rick up. Well, Father, we just want to thank you. I want to thank you for being amazing. Before I go on, I wanted to just release one word over my brother in the white shirt back here, Keith. You know, when I was standing during praise and worship, I looked behind myself for one second to check the time to make sure everybody was on time. <laughs> And when I did, I got a word for you, but I didn't know it was you. Like when I looked, I didn't know, oh, that's Keith. And when I came up here, I said, oh, that's Keith. And, um, and so I thought, well, it's Keith. Maybe I shouldn't give the word. Not, not, not that, that, that I think, I, I just thought, well, I don't know. But I felt like God said this to you. I felt like God said, Keith, to you that, that, uh, I heard this word, he's opening you up. This is exactly what I heard. He's opening you up, and when he opens you up, he's opening you up, not one, to ministry. Two, that he's opening you up because you've been closed. And he said circumstances over the years have closed you up, but he's opening you up. And as he opens you up and you begin to see his goodness and kindness and anointing flow out of you, you're also going to begin to receive stuff you've never received. And he says things will begin to change. And they will get better and brighter and bigger and more awesome as each day goes, there's a change from this day on. I'd release that over you, brother. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
All right, let's close our eyes just for a moment. If you're here today and you've never stopped long enough in life to say, Jesus, I need you. The Bible calls it being born again. We also, or the Bible also calls it being saved. It also is understood that God moves from heaven and he comes to live inside of you. When a person accepts Christ... Jesus literally comes to live inside of you, and you know he's there. You know he's living in you just like a mama knows when a baby's in her tummy. So if you're here this morning and you've never really stopped long enough to say, Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, I need you. I give you my life. I surrender. If you've never done that, we want to take this time to pray with you so that you can have a new beginning and a new life. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up so we can pray for you. Anybody at all that says, that's me, slip your hand up. We'd like to be able to pray with you and get you a brand new beginning, a brand new life. Anybody at all? I see that hand, ma'am. Thank you. I appreciate your courage. Anybody at all that says, that's me. I know God's been tugging at my heart. Thank you, sir. I know God's been pulling at my heart. You might sense he's been after you. You might be saying, well, I want to kind of get my act together. You're not going to get it together until you get God. You don't get fixed to get God. You get God to get fixed. Thank you, ma'am. I see that hand. Young lady, thank you. I see that hand. Anybody else that says, sir, thank you. I appreciate that courage. Anybody else that says, yes, in my heart, I know I need God. I know I need help. Anybody else? I'm going to ask you if you lifted your hand up, if you'll stand up, please. We want to be able to pray with you. We want to be able to want to be able to rejoice with what God's doing in your life. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I'll tell you what. Can you come up here? We'll pray with you up front. Come on. I know you say, oh, no, don't ask me to come up front. Come on. Come up here. Thanks. Thanks.